I don't know, I think those songs are so beautiful. And I think all of them have said such incredible things to us today. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine and yours. To God be the glory, great things he has done, huh? And Jesus is our firm foundation. And in that song that we sang for the offering, Lord, I'm amazed by you. I don't know about you, but it's something I think we should say every day. We should never get used to the things God does. It should always amaze us with freshness and newness. The bridge of that song said this, How wide, how deep, How great is your love for me? Did you see that picture of that person standing there by the lake? How wide, how deep, how great. It's like you can't can't reach around it. It's just too big. How wide and how deep and how great is your love for me? And this last song, our chains are gone. We've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. It's a beautiful chorus written to that old hymn. And we have it today because we have our last sermon on our covenant. And so your covenant has been in your bulletin every week for the last, what? It seems like forever I've been preaching on this covenant. Doesn't it? (laughs) You're about ready to just uh, throw me out with the bathwater. But we're going to read the whole thing today, and we're actually going to think of the last three statements are, are what we're going to talk about today. So let's take it out, and let's read it. As one who has had the opportunity of meeting Jesus Christ and responding to Him, I gladly and freely seek to live out this experience in my total life commitment. Part of this I seek to express through the fellowship of the Westside Baptist Church of Topeka, and I will diligently strive to do the following. Meet God daily through scripture reading and prayer. Worship God weekly with our church family and other fellow Christians. Give proportionately as God prospers me for the support of our church and its missions. Support faithfully the work of our church by contributing my time and talents to one of its ministries. Witness frequently to God's loving deeds so that others may be added to the church. Educate our children in God's word. Aid fellow members and others in sickness and distress. Grow in love for fellow members and all people everywhere. And if I should move from this place... I will seek another fellowship of Christians within which I can carry out these purposes and commitments. There you have it. That's what you all have promised as members of Westside Baptist Church. So how does that fit? How is that fitting? Is it fitting fitting good? You've gone into the fitting room and tried it on. You're looking at yourself now in the mirror. How does it look on you? I'm just asking a question. How does it look on you? There you go. Here's a little honesty there. That's right. Isn't it the truth? <laughs> It fits in some places, but not in others. Now, that's 
that's a good observation as well. The last three statements of our covenant for First Baptist Church talks about what it means to be a part of the body of Christ. Aiding fellow members and others. See, that's the important part that we cannot forget. Aiding fellow members and others in distress, in sickness, Growing in love with fellow members? How are we doing with that? It's pretty easy to love most of you all out there. I like you. I do. I like, I like you. But then there's that and all people everywhere thing. Huh? What? Wait a minute. That means loving somebody that I might not know. That might not be one tiny bit like me. Might not look like me. Have the same color skin as me. Walk the same roads as I walk. Maybe they do something that I don't even necessarily like too much. You mean them too? Is that really what we're promising? Whew, I don't know about you, but that scares me to death. And I think it ought to. Because there's a lot of other sidewalks on a lot of other streets where our sidewalk ends. There's other sidewalks to travel. Then it says, if I should move from this place, and I'm not going to, of course, let that happen. So if you feel like moving from this place, I'm going to have to fight you on that. I'll have to tie you up and throw you in the closet somewhere because I don't want to think about anybody leaving. But from time to time in churches, you leave. And I've had to leave my fair share as a pastor. And it's always hard to go. But you go because of the Spirit. Not because of... Well, let me just say, not because of other reasons. And so, with these last three statements in our covenant, I thought we'd turn to the book of Ephesians. There's no other book that will talk to you in the New Testament more about what it means to be the body of Christ than the book of Ephesians. If you want to find out about church unity and how a church comes together and what it means and how that happens and then how it is we're supposed to live, you go and you look at the book of Ephesians. And today we're going to look at two separate passages. The first one is from Ephesians 3. And Ephesians 3 passage is kind of the end of the first section. Ephesians can be split into two parts. The first part starts with the first verse of chapter 1 and goes through chapter 3. And in that first part, Paul is trying to put down the theological understandings of what it means to be the body of Christ. The second part of Ephesians starts with the first verse in chapter 4, and it basically answers the question then, how then shall we live? <laughs> if this is who we are, how is it going to work together? What happens in the body? And so Ephesians is split into the, these two parts, and we're going to read the end of the first section and the beginning of the second section. So Ephesians 3, 14 through 19. For this reason, Paul writes, 
And the reason he's talking about here is about how God has put us all together. The reasons and the hows to how God has put us together. That's what he's talking about. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted, hear our covenant here, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend, here comes your head, folks, your brains, <laughs> the mental faculties God has given you to think, right? I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints. Remember our song, Amazed, we sang? What is the breadth and length and height and depth? And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Oh, my Lord, what a passage of Scripture. You could preach on that for a year, don't you think, pastors? Oh, it's like every few words just are rich with meaning. Then he starts the second part of his letter by writing Ephesians 4, 1 through 6, and he says this, I, therefore, the prisoner of, in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness. Now, here's a word I wish you would have left out. With patience. There it is. I can't get rid of it no matter how hard I try. That word just hangs there, doesn't it? With patience. Bearing with one another in love. Some translations will have just the word forbearance. Bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, there is one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. Oh, my goodness. I'm under the impression that Paul here is saying some things to us that we need to hear today. You all need to know that the people of the Ward Mead Neighborhood Association who meets here in our church once a month, I think we only have one person who goes to that meeting. I think that's Elmira. Elmira goes to that meeting. I go to that meeting sometimes. There's a lot of complaining that goes on in that meeting, and it kind of bothers me sometimes. I want to say, quit your complaining and do something to make it look better and be better and feel better. If you think something needs to be done, don't wait for somebody else to do it. You do it. That's what I want to say to them all. But I have to tell you this. That group of people, none of them except for one, comes to this church. 
and every single one of those people will look at us as the West Side Baptist Church and tell us to our face that this church is an anchor in this community. Really? Have you ever thought about that? The thought that this church here is an anchor in this community. What does an anchor do? It grounds you, doesn't it? You're not just kind of drifting along somewhere. There's something that grounds us in this community. And there's something grounding about this church in this community. I think we need to hear that. I think we need to hear that, but not only do we need to hear that, we need to really stop and think about what that means. One of the things I believe it means is that the people in this community are standing here looking on, looking in, looking at our life as a church. And they are seeing something that matters. And what they're seeing, I believe, and I hope to be the truth, is that they see a group of people who are being rooted and grounded in love. Would you agree with that? Are we doing that? Are we as a group of folks being rooted and grounded in love? It's a good question. Because Jesus tells us in the book of John, in the 17th chapter of John, I believe it's this high priestly prayer 17, right? John 17? Yes. That when we are one... When we share unity of spirit, when we really give of ourselves to not just the people you like, or even the people you're married to, <laughs> sorry, married folks, I've got to pick on you once in a while. But when we share unity with people that we might not even know. Do you know, I got to tell you something. I was here for probably a month or so. And is Larry Dell here today? No. I'm going to tell you a story. I could not remember Larry Dell's name. He was standing back here. And I went to three different people in the congregation and I said, what's that guy's name that's standing back there with the bulletins? And people went to see who I was talking about and they came back to me and they said, I don't know. <laughs> what? You don't know? I've been here for just a few months, and I know more folks than you do. We're not that big, are we? I mean, look around here. We've got, what, about 70 people here today? Anybody count? Has anybody counted? About 56 people. I think we could do... I think... Adonis, I think you could learn 56 names, don't you? See, look. <laughs> Thank you, Adonis. Did you hear that? He has absolutely no thought that he wouldn't be able to hear, uh, learn 56 names. How about you, Devin? You think you could learn 56 names? Ah, oh, I have faith in you. <laughs> There you have it. But we're not that big. 
And if we're going to be rooted and grounded in love, and if we are going to be people that Paul talks about in Ephesians, learning and comprehending what is the length and the breadth and the depth, well, goodness sakes, if we can't understand and comprehend, the, if we can't learn somebody's name that you sit in the pew with every day, how are we ever going to comprehend the length and the breadth and the depth and the height? I mean, it starts with baby steps, right? And so on Sunday mornings, I'm making you feel guilty, and that's okay. My grandmother taught me well. She was Norwegian. <laughs> on Sunday mornings, when we get up and greet everybody, we are giving you permission to go up to somebody that you know you've seen but you know that you just cannot get their name. We give you permission to ask each other's name. Would you promise to do that? Raise your right hand. I promise. Come on. I promise. <laughs> That's what we promise to each other in our covenant. We promise, it says, to grow in love with fellow members and others. And it's hard when you can't even remember a name. I'm just as bad. The oldest, or older I get, the more I can't remember. But you know what? I've decided I'm going to keep asking. And you might get tired of me asking. And that's just too bad. Because if I can't remember your name, I'm going to ask. That way, you become more than just a face. You become a person with a name. And I love that passage in Isaiah 43, where he says, if you walk through the fire, you're not going to be burned. If you walk through the waters, I will be with you. And the floods won't over, overwhelm you. Why? Because I am the Lord your God. I know your name. I love that. God knows our name. God whispers your name. God loves us. Well, the question is how. And I wanted to say just briefly about this passage. It means that, number one, if we confess Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we have the same Father who gives us our names and gives us a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. You remember that old gospel hymn? Therefore, we have a new identity. We have a new destiny. When he says, I bow my knee before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. You and I have the name of the Father, the great creator God, stamped on our lives. That means we have a new hope, a new destiny, a new name, a new goal, a new road. He'll say it like this in Ephesians 4. One hope, one faith, one Lord, one baptism. I get excited about this. Secondly, we are recipients of God's Spirit. And because we are recipients of God's Spirit, we have power. And we forget that sometimes. But we have power to be the people God needs us to be. Yeah? It says, I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit. We are given power from the Spirit inside of us to do and to be the people God needs us to be, right? 
Do we stop and think about that? <laughs> what that means? It means that it's not up to our own strength. God will give us the strength to do what he needs us to do, to grow in this love. It means that Jesus promised that he will be with us to the end of the age. Remember when he said that? Is true because of the Spirit who's living and working in our hearts. Jesus is alive. How? Through the Spirit in you. And the world will know the tomb is empty when they see your hearts are full. They will know that he is living when he lives in me and you. The world will know who holds tomorrow when we hold to him today. Because of that power living inside. And, because, and through that power, we can become a family. Yes, with all of our foibles and with all the things I don't like about you and you don't like about me. We don't leave those on the doorstep when we walk in here. We bring all of our idiosyncrasies with us. And you know there are things about you that you don't even like. Well, when we come together, here we all are, and we bring those things right along with us. And we love each other anyway. And when we do, the world around us sees that there is something different about us. And when we learn how to love each other within these walls, just think of what we can do out there. Right? Just think. We practice it in here so that we can go out there. But so often this becomes the end all. And when we're in here, we're safe. When we're out there, we're exposed. But this is where we're supposed to be learning what it is to love. So that when we walk out these doors and into the world around us, we can love in new ways. Oh, I love these passages. We are part of a bigger family. This, this uh, passage reminds us. And some of them are here. Some of the bigger family are right here. And some of them are in heaven. Yeah. Some of our family have left us. But Paul says this. Together with those we can see and with the saints, those who have gone before us, who have paved the way, who stand in heaven's gates cheering us on, the book of Hebrews will say, let's keep running this race and being the people that God needs us to be. We are all of us on a journey to comprehend and understand, Paul says, what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth that God's love has demonstrated in Jesus? I think through all of this, we find that God is calling us to unity. God is calling us to unity. He's calling us to be the people we need to be. He's trying in his wisdom to make us one to make us a united body. He's making us to become love. He's making us pure. He's making us into the people he needs to be. And for that, we give him thanks and praise. May it be our prayer. Amen.